is the glory forever and ever. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever and ever. Let us sing yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. In the name of Jesus, we thank you because all things are yours. You are the maker and the owner of all things. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because all things are yours and you are our portion in the land of the living. And that is the reason why we have all things and we are bound unto every good work. In the name of Jesus, Father, we give you praise. Let us be seated. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wow, God is good. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. I feel like going to sit on that side because it looks like that's where the action is. It's almost everyone is seated on that side. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. So um, we thank God because according to our original contract uh, over the building, this would have been the last service here, but we thank God because it isn't. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, we're still here and we'll keep you abreast as that unfolds by the grace of God. I am excited to be here today and I want us to quickly take a look at the book of Matthew chapter 6 and we're going to read verse 44. Matthew, the gospel according to Saint Matthew chapter 6. And... Once we're done reading, we will pray. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, we're going to read, and then we will pray. All righty. So, verse 24. In fact, let me just quickly read from verse 22 for, uh, for Ade's sake. The Bible says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The word great, usually when the Bible uses the word great, it talks about the scope or the expanse of a thing, not just the weight of it, okay? So when the Bible says the darkness is great, that means even when there is light around you, there's no way of you telling because there is darkness within you. So every aspect of your existence and reality is shrouded in darkness. So because if your eye is good and there's light within you, even if there is darkness around you, you can, you can illuminate the darkness. Remember Psalms uh, 139 that we read last meeting, we read it on Saturday, where David said, even when I go looking for darkness and I choose darkness, he says, because God loves me so much, dark darkness then becomes light unto me. You understand what I mean? And so even if I go to darkness on the outside, because of his love that is light within my soul, even the dark of night suddenly becomes light to me which is letting us know that it is not what you have around you that matters as much as what is within you. Alrighty, just before we go on the bit of technical check, um, Emmanuel, could you please help me double check to ensure that the streaming sound is as good as this sound that we can hear in the room? And if this one, if I can hear myself just a little bit more, I'll be really excited. Just a tad more, maybe another 5 to 10%. Praise the Lord. Well, God is good. That is 12%, but I take it. It's good. God is good. So, verse 24. It says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon refers to the God of the monetary system. 
Okay? So I'm going to quickly remind us of two things here. Um, let me see if I, can find, if I can find it here for you real quick because I, I'm looking across the room and it does seem like there are some people who may not have been here uh, when I last talked about um, these gods that have got to do with money. And um, one of the things that we have to be careful in explaining without scaring anybody is when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about God, which is G-A-D, and we're talking about money, which I think is spelled as M-A-N-I. Uh, those are gods in the Old Testament that have to do with material possession and that have to do with money. So um, I believe we can talk about that in detail at another time, but I want us to just focus on the New Testament uh, presentation of the spirit behind money, which is called mammon, right? The Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, I'm glad that we read verse 22 and 23 because, you know, there's a way Jesus typically sets the stage when he's about to introduce um, a level of understanding that is contrary to what a lot of the audience, a lot of his audience may have subscribed to. So he starts by using things that are very physical and things that are very highly consequential so that people can relate with the spiritual dimension that he brings. You know, many people at the time may not have thought about the spirit behind the economy or the spirit behind money from the standpoint of a being that exists and seeks worship. You understand what I mean? And so they, they think about God. Oh, I love God. I, I, I make sacrifices. I, I do things in the name of God. But many people at the time that Jesus was speaking to them may not have actually taken time to look at the weight of mammon in their lives, how it compares to the weight of the things of God in their lives. And so Jesus started talking to them about light and darkness. Because many people can relate with light and darkness. But the reality of it is this, one of those quantities or one of those um, phenomena actually has to do with one of the spirits. The Bible says that God is his word. And the entrance of his word brings light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So we know that God is the author of light. The Bible says with him there is no variableness, no shadow of turning, because he is the unapproachable light. He is light. And so if God is light, then what is mammon? It's a no-brainer. Mammon cannot be another light. <laughs> it is darkness. Yes, as much as we like money, let us call it what it is. Someone is saying, oh, but the Bible says money answers all things. <laughs> it does. And that is because of the system that we're in. If not for the system that we're in, money does not answer all things. Because when it comes to God's kingdom, money doesn't answer all things. In the book of Isaiah, the Bible says, come and buy, you who have no money. And so if money answers all things when it comes to righteousness, peace, and joy, then we would have been told to, to, to go get money before we buy. So it is possible to actually transact business in the kingdom of heaven without money. But in the kingdom of this world, money answers all things. You want anybody to come and do anything for you? Cut your grass, money. Massage your feet, money. Big people... Yeah, 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 yeah. You want to start charging me money for my side of my feet? Everything, money. Why? And I've explained to you that the reason why it is so is because God requires for the system that will be in the time of Jesus' return to be another Sodom and Gomorrah. And when you remember, if you remember when I was breaking down to you the history of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were twin cities that were totally dedicated to the service of mammon, they charged money for everything. One of the accounts that we saw in the book of Yasha was when Abraham had sent 
his servant, one of his servants, his principal servant, to go and check on Lot. And when the man was there looking for Lot, there was someone who approached him, actually as he was right in the heart of Sodom, and the gentleman slapped his face. And Abraham's servant was like, what have I done to you? What's the meaning of that? The guy was like, did you feel the pain? He says, yes. He says, pay me. He said, because you couldn't have had that experience otherwise. So I have provided you a service. So whether you need that service or not, by your own assessment, it doesn't matter. As long as I conclude that you need it, then you have to pay for it. Does that sound familiar? There are so many services that we have been asked to pay for that we didn't particularly ask for. To be honest, I didn't ask for the HOV lane or the peach pass. I didn't ask for it because I'm quite happy to just let let's all of us just use all the lanes that exist. You see what I mean? But then if you're caught there, by the time you get home, a letter is waiting for you. And the question is, did you feel that? Pay me. And so we see that it is by God's design. And I, I will tell you the reason why that is by God's design. You see, everything that God does, he does because of his love. Okay? And so if the last system is not a system that is being run heavily by mammon, then the end will not come because the end of the system of this world was already defined by Nimrod, and we see that in Genesis chapter 10. Okay? So Genesis chapter 10, in fact, I'm going to take the liberty of going through that verse of Scripture with us again, simply because I still don't think the views on the video has gone up. That was that video that I recorded in the basement, and people did not watch it. My heart was kind of broken because I put a lot into that video. But for some reason, I think the algorithms of mammon got in the way, but no weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. So let me tell you two more things about the light, your eyes, and, and darkness. You see, when people are in the dark, it's very easy for them to stumble. Jesus says there are 12 hours in the day and 12 hours of the night, and those who walk in the light will not stumble, but the ones who walk in the dark, they will stumble. So the darkness makes for stumbling feet because you cannot see. One of the other things that the darkness does is the darkness prevents people from making the right choices. If there are objects that are set before you and you do not have light to be able to assess each one of them on the basis of you know, just, just generally to be able to assess them, how do you choose? So what do people do? They choose blindly. You understand what I mean? And so the darkness is there to weaken some of the abilities that God has given to us, in fact, privileges that we have. And it makes for us to then ask ourselves the question every time we need to make a decision or take an action, of course, all of our actions should come after we have made decisions that are wise, even though that is not always the case, but that's the way it should be, you know, because Jesus says no one builds the house unless having counted the cost. We're not supposed to just act. We're supposed to have deliberated and thought about it and make decisions that we can stand by before we take actions that can help us to stand and buy. So here is the deal. Many people... Don't stop to ask, do I have enough light? Can I see what is set before me? Is there light around me? If no, is there light within me? There are times when you find yourself in situations that are still puzzling, situations that are maybe veiled to you, but do you have light within you to be able to act by divine instinct even though you do not know what the world has covered up? Let me give you an example. You have been presented with two jobs, I mean, two employment opportunities. I, I try not to use the word job. Two employment opportunities. And as you know, until you start work there, you can't tell how good their coffee is. It's sometimes hard to tell how reasonable the employer is. Because when people are interviewing you, both of you are playing the same ping pong game. You put up your best behavior, they put up their best behavior you dress nice for the interview. They talk nice at the interview. You see, until you start, you don't really see people's true colors. Because people usually set job interviews 
you know, looking into their schedule and choosing a time wherein they know that their head is correct, that their moods are right. But when you start working with them, you don't know when the switch, when, the fl when they flip the switch on you, and you're like, my gosh, at the interview, they were sounding like angels. Now they are manifesting demons. The pay is still the same, but the experience is not quite what you expected. So those things are veiled from you or are veiled to you, I meant to say. You cannot really see until you get in there. And so that is an example of walking into a situation that is shrouded in darkness because the light that you need is actually by design a light that comes by you walking into it, which is, which is fair. You know, the Bible says that the Word of God is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Most times we wish that the Word of God was a lamp unto our path. And let me explain that if you, if you haven't heard me talk about that before. When you hold a lamp, it only illuminates the area around your feet. Okay, so you can only see that next step, which is good because then you don't stumble. You can see what's immediately around you. It is not until you continue to take one step after another on the path that that lamp now becomes a light to the path. Does it make sense? Because many of us, we want the Word of God to tell us everything that is going to happen to us day after day so that you can stand and access if your life is worth living or not. You know, you want to know exactly what's going to happen at 4 p.m. Tuesday of next week. In fact, you want to know what's going to happen in the summer of 2045 to decide whether you're still going to be here or you're going to check out. But the reality of it is that is not how it works. In fact, today, I was thinking about certain decisions that I would like to make, and I thought to myself, but I already have a prophetic insight into what's going to happen in the world concerning this decision that I want to make. But for some reason, I'm unable to actually use that prophecy for myself. I was about to feel bad, and then the Lord reminded me that it is a privilege, not a right. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to celebrate the privilege that I have in him of knowing prophetically what's going to happen. But, you know, as human beings, sometimes you want to use what God has given you for you. But that is not always how it works, you know. It is for the body. The Bible says these gifts have been given for the edifying of the body and the perfecting of the saints. You are made perfect in your ability to be able to trust God for the gift and trust that the gift will serve the body and that the body will be edified as opposed to that you can then take that gift and use it to enrich yourself, use that gift as an advantage to beat the system. Sometimes it kind of works that way, but it is not intended to be that way. That's not the primary focus of it. So going back to what I was saying, there are times wherein you wish that the word of God was a lamp onto your path, but it is not. It is a lamp onto your feet, and it is not until you start taking one step after another that you can then look back and see that the path that you have been on has been illuminated by the word of God. So what that means is that there are still situations wherein we don't know what is immediately ahead until we have stepped forward. If you know everything about those two employment opportunities before you start, then there is no room for you to trust God for things that you will face when the time comes. Because if you can see everything that is ahead of you, you will start to practice being God rather than practice trusting God. And so when things are veiled from you, you can consider those things as being in the dark. But Jesus says sometimes, that could happen as long as you have light inside of you, you will be fine. So how do I get to choose between employment opportunity A and employment opportunity B? I'm able to do that even though I don't know what those um, employers hold in their heart or what the opportunity fully holds in, the, in detail, but I have light within me that can guide me into selecting one of them and that will be the will of God for my life for that season. Does that make sense? Now people get to a situation wherein they're confused, they cannot choose because there's darkness around and there is also darkness within. So again, it is not the complexity of your environment that matters as much as the clarity of your notion. 
if you are clear within you that the Lord is with you and that the hand of the Lord guides you and he leads you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, you will walk, first of all, you will think, talk, and walk as someone who is illuminated. Let us face it, the way things are going in the world today, it is hard to tell because darkness has indeed come upon the earth and grows darkness to people. The reason why we don't chat with people as much on the plane, on the bus, and at the grocery store as much as we used to is because you don't know what's going to come out of them. You know, back in the day, you can almost have a conversation about anything and everybody would just <laughs> talk and, and even sing kumbaya and hold hands and, and pay for each other and then go home. But this time around, you start talking to someone about the, mund the most mundane things and they, they look at you and judge your choice of toilet paper. Because they have done their research and they have come to know that the manufacturers of that toilet paper do not support their own political agenda. And for you to be buying that toilet paper means you must be supporting them and that makes you an enemy of theirs. And so we have learned to just mind our businesses. Why? Because darkness has covered the earth and gross darkness to people. When people are shrouded in darkness, from your perspective, it is hard to tell where they're coming from or where they're going. Everything becomes a gamble, but it doesn't have to be. Because the truth of the matter is, if the light in you be darkness, it is a great darkness. But Jesus says there is another option, which is to have your eyes be good. And if your eyes are good, then your entire body will be full of light. That is not particularly where we're going in fullness, but let me touch upon what it means to have good eyes. You see, the Bible says when God made everything, he looked and behold, all that he saw was good. And I reminded you, I think Tuesday last week, that everything that God was looking at included the serpent. Because the serpent was already in the garden. Mosquitoes were there. And I mean, and to you and I, there's nothing good about those. You understand what I mean? But when God looked, he saw that it was good, not necessarily because what he was looking at was good, but the eyes with which he was looking at it was good. When my wife married me, I was no good. But her eyes were good. Because she could see the good, even though it was not yet on the surface. You understand what I mean? And so God was already able to see that even though the serpent will deceive the woman and the man, the reality of it is that without the deception and the fall, they would not come under the grace of the divine sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so ultimately, because it ends in praise, by grace, the Lord was able to call it good. So for your eyes to be good is simply to see through the eyes of the God that is good. Because Jesus says not none is good except the Father. Because when I look at things, I look at things and I see from the perspective of my limitations. I look at some people and I'm like, I cannot work with them simply because just from two minutes of talking to them, they've already tried my patience. So I'm like, not today. I'm not, I'm not yeah, this person is not going to work here. You see, and then you, you start pretending to be nice. Oh, actually, maybe you can just email us your quote and... We'll take a look at it, but the reality of it is in your mind, you've already looked at it and saying that you're not going to do business. So what am I driving at? If we judge, if we use these eyes that are in our skull, quite often we will see evil when we could actually see good. We will see darkness instead of seeing light. And so the only way in reality to see or to have good eyes or to have a set of good eyes is to be able to leverage your heavenly father's eyes to see what God sees when it looks when you look at people to see what God sees when you observe situations it is very critical for us to know that otherwise we will not truly know how to navigate this world that we're in if your eye is single if your eye well that's the secret I, I didn't mean to say it that way but now that I've said it I'm gonna just say it because you have two eyes and sometimes they work as two <laughs> wow 
I think there's a deeper revelation in there. <laughs> that, you know, so sometimes they work us too. But when you look at God, even though you're made in his image and in his likeness, the eyes of God work as one. The Bible says the eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth, seeking for that man whose mind is stayed on him. So God's eye, God, the eyes of God work as single vision because he has determined that good is all I am looking for. And you know, we talked about that about a week ago, that the eye of God is single. He's focused on the man whose mind is stayed on him. God is not looking for the wicked. He's not using one eye to look for good people and using one eye to look for bad people that he will punish. His eye is single. It's like, I'm going after good people. And that is the reason why in another um, account where Jesus was talking about being illuminated, he says, let your eye be single and your entire body will be full of light. So to have good eyes is to have single vision. To have single vision is to have the God kind of vision. A vision that is not guided by what it sees, but a vision that is guided by what it determines to see. For business people, let me encourage you. If I, for everybody, let me encourage you. You see, if you're looking at things the way they are and also trying to see things that the, see things the way they need to be, you are, you, you are at risk of being discouraged. Because sometimes your commitment to driving things to how you see them being may not be as great as your sentiment against the way things currently are. And so when your sentiment overwhelms your commitment, you give up, you give in, and you go home. But God is not looking at things the way they are. His vision is so focused that he's just looking at those things the way they need to be. And that is what continues to fuel his commitment. Because while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us because God was not seeing sinners. He was seeing sons and daughters. And that is the reason why no matter how foolish people were, he just wasn't ready to give up. He just kept going. All righty. So praise the Lord for that. Now, we're going to be able to use that in just a moment, but let's go back to 24. Um, as I was standing there, the Lord impressed upon my heart that it is imperative for us to talk a little bit more about the prophetic word that came forth on Saturday about what is coming into the world. Now, let me, let me you see, let me categorize this prophecy uh, along with the prophecies that I gave to y'all toward the end of 2021. You see, toward the end of 2021, I told you the moment we saw the gift that was given to God by the two angels that came from the land divided by waters that was delivered and placed in the abominable place, I said to you, the destruction of the elite has come and it will be like the pangs of a woman in labor. Now, someone is like, oh, 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 wait a minute. What is that gift that was given to God? There are prophecies talking about the fact that a gift will come from a land divided by a, a river and that it's going to come from a land of a people talk, tall and smooth of skin. And that gift will be placed in an abominable place. That happened toward the end of 2021 when the couple coming from Mexico, the husband and wife, both of their names mean angel. One actually literally means angel. The other one, I think it means messenger or bringer of good news. They, they were angels by their names. And they both de designed this artwork, which was a sculpture that they brought to the abominable place, which is the United Nations building in New York. I call it the abominable place because the Bible says it has an abominable name. And what is the abominable name? The name is Un. UN in French means one. And God said in Genesis 11 that they are not to remain one. We are only allowed by heaven to be one in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, Lord, make them one as we are one. When we were one outside of Christ Jesus, we were headed towards destruction because we built the Tower of Babel. Right? And God says we will forbid them from being one until they can handle it, which is under the captain of their salvation. And so when human beings come together and say that they're going to choose a name that says that we are one, then they may mean well, but good intentions are not always God intentions. And particularly when we already know that God says, don't be one like that. You understand what I mean? And so it is a name that is abominable. He doesn't, he's not talking about necessarily about the good people working there, but he's just talking about from the perspective of heaven. So if you have a cousin that works for the UN, don't stop talking to them. It's not about the people. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities and powers. And you know, when we look at the word principalities, it has to do greatly with principles. There are just certain times wherein the principles of God are what they are. We can't question them. We don't fight against it. We just recognize it when we see it, right? And I believe personally, by the grace of God also, that the reason why, or predominantly, it was called a gift to God was because God had a message for us leading to 2020 that many people ignored. And so that Rockefeller Center, where this sculptor was taken to, he had the face of a lion, the skin of a leopard, and it had the claws of a bear. Right? Remember that image? If you don't know what I'm talking about, go and Google it. It was brought from Mexico and brought to the, to the image. And then on top of that, they put the image of a skeleton that was standing in a garment of judgment behind that image. But they took that one away very quickly. So many people didn't, didn't actually see it. Thank God for, uh, what's his name? Uh, who sent me that image before it was taken down from the internet. And the reality of it was, when we see that image, what follows is death and destruction. And that was what the skeleton represented. Okay? So, when you, now let's analyze a little further the reason why it was a gift to God, or one of the additional reasons, or how I came to that conclusion. Well, let me not say it that way, because the Holy Spirit told me. So, it wasn't like I was reasoning in my cleverness and came up with it. They gave it to me. Okay? So, what he showed me was an inscription on the doorway to the Rockefeller Center. So, every, almost every picture that we saw online that captured that image captured the scripture. And up until then, I didn't know that there was a scripture that is written on that UN building. And you know what the scripture says? In fact, it's so interesting because... It was, it was hatched into a golden canvas. And you know what Solomon says? Solomon says a word that is fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. And so when you see a golden canvas or a golden inscription, it's letting you know that that is the word that is fit for you. And what does it say? It says wisdom shall be the stability of your times. On a, on, a, on a UN building. That's what's there. And it's not just a scripture. It was a scripture that was written out of the tail end of the trumpet of an angel. You can go and look these things up. I, if, I, if I knew I was talking about it today, I would have gotten the image pulled up. But you can look it up. And there was an angel there with a trumpet. And at the end of the trumpet, the scripture was there. Then the Holy Spirit said to me, that is one of the trumpets that has been blown in Revelations to let you know the time that you are in. By show of hands, how many people remember that sculptor? Now, do you know one of the very first things that caught my attention when I heard about the sculpture or, sculpt, or, or the, um, the edifice, because I, I want to refer to it with, together with the, the skeleton behind the way they set it up was that they gave it a name. And what name did they give to it? They called it safety and security. Right? Now, what does the Bible say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3? The Bible says when they say peace and safety, then their destruction will come. And like, here it is, peace and safety, written on the image. And that was late 2021. So what did I say to y'all after all of that was downloaded to me by the Holy Spirit? I told you, I said a war is coming and the kings of the earth will war against each other. And shortly after that, I give you an update because it was also revealed to me that some fallen angels, uh, let, me, let me tell you what they really are. They are creations or offsprings so to speak, of fallen angels, giant men with alien technology in some underground basement, um, and they're creating weapons. But the kings on the one side think they alone have those weapons. But they're also creating the weapons for the king on the other side. Because the Bible says, according to the prophecies of Esdras, that by so doing, their destruction will be made complete. I want you to follow me here because... There, is, there really isn't anyone else to tell these things to, so I'm sorry, y'all just have to listen. 
Is everyone listening? Praise the Lord. So, I'm, I'm summarizing stuff from like three or four messages now, from the past, right? And so what happened was, January of 2022, because I started saying that in November, I said it into December, and January came, the war in Ukraine broke loose. The word Ukraine means the middle ground or the battlefield, Ukraina. That's what it means. And then who are the people fighting? Vlad, the Vladimirs are fighting. One of them is called Vladimir, and the other one is called Volodymyr. They mean the same thing in their language, just different dialects. And what does it mean? Vladimir means ruler of the world. So the two rulers, the two factions that are worldly factions have been raised up to fight one another. I'm not going to tell their last names because I don't want to distract you from where I'm going today because the moment people hear the meaning of those two last names, ah, then it's like, okay, so I'm, do I need to choose side? No, no, no. You have already chosen Jesus. Let that be enough for you. You understand what I mean? Because I used to say it very happily, you know, because I, you know me, when I have revelation, I'm excited to share. But then after a while, I noticed that some people that I said it with, they decided to choose sides politically rather than choose based on revelation. They chose politically because they took their own understanding of what I said and ran with it. And I don't want their blood to be sought from my hands. So I have learned to be more careful the way that I share these things. But let's just keep it to the fact that prophecy is being fulfilled simply because we saw that which had already been baked into prophecy as an indicator to you and I so that we know the times that we're in. Now, remember that that was one of the first things that Paul said to the people of Thessalonians. And so by the time he was talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus, he said to the ones who are without understanding, the coming of the Lord Jesus will be as a thief in the night. He said, but to you, it will not be so. He said, in fact, I do not have to tell you because you already know. How, how do we already know? Because in verse 3, he told us that they will declare peace and safety and their destruction will come. So from the moment their destruction comes, what are you supposed to do? Listen to what the angel of the Lord is saying. And the angel of the Lord is saying, wisdom shall be the stability of your times. What is wisdom? Wisdom is light, deliverable. The form in which light is deliverable to the heart of a man is called wisdom and that is the what that's what God wants you to choose oh come on now yeah you found it so this is not not that one not the dragon but the leopard you see that one right and then can you zoom in on the on the trumpet of the angel of the Lord can you see the angel of the Lord blowing the trumpet in the middle, if you can zoom in in the middle, it says wisdom shall be the stability of your time. I believe this is the Rockefeller Center, one of the UN buildings that, okay, zooming is not working today. Okay, so but basically, you can see the dragon, you can see the leopard, and you see death and destruction coming behind according to the prophecy of John and Revelation. You see the woman that is in the, the skeleton and the garb of assassination. All righty. So let me see this one. That angel of the Lord, as you can see, is there. And you see the trumpets. And then you see the warning. It says, wisdom shall be the stability of your times. These things were already staged by God so that you and I are without excuse. As soon as we saw that, did we see, did the war begin? The war began. And all of the efforts that are going into the war made it difficult for us to remain in the chokehold of the lockdown. So they had to give up the lockdown simply because people need to move around for the sake of the war. I was at Heathrow Airport. We booked a ticket even before the lockdown was lifted because we knew that we were being led by the Holy Spirit to do the same. And people were like, how did you know they were going to lift it? We're like, well, we just knew we were to book it. There was still darkness around. Nobody knew what was going on, but there was light within. And so when we got to Heathrow Airport, I told my wife, I said, this airport is busy, but I've been flying out of here for about 20 years. This is an unusual kind of busy. I said, the Lord has just revealed to me that a lot of the people that are here have been positioned for battle. These are food soldiers. 
And these are errand men and women for the war that is happening at the border. I reminded you of all of that because the prophecy of Saturday, I want you to, I want to categorize that to you in the same order of this prophecy. The way that I declared to you that the war was coming is the way that I declared to you that certain things will be withheld from us. It's kind of like the, the inverse of the lockdown. The lockdown, we were withheld from things told to stay at home, but now even they don't need to tell you to stay at home. You can go wherever you want. It's just that some of those places will no longer be available. They will, access will be restricted because the doors will be shut. Okay? I was going to say do with that what you will. But then I also know that the Lord already told me what you must do with it. And I told you on Saturday, and I'm going to say it again. It is not for you to do anything out of fear. It is for you to now remain confident in God and be reminded that you do not need mammon. You have God. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. I want to just quickly remind us of two fundamental principles. Wisdom shall be the stability of your times. What times? These times. And what is wisdom? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I want you to listen very closely because Jesus was hitting at certain things here. What did he tell you not to do with mammon? He said, well, you cannot serve two masters. He didn't say you, you, you can't worship one and then worship the other. No, he specifically used the word love and hate. Why is that? Because the love of mammon, the love of money, money itself is not the root of evil. It is the love of money that is the root of evil. Okay? Are, are we together? So that's why Jesus is saying the love of money, the Bible says the love of money is the root of evil. Jesus is saying you either love one and hate the other. You cannot love both of them. So to love God and to be conscious of your love for God and his love for you is the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom. So the people who still continue to love mammon, right, will have the root of evil, but no wisdom. So when the times, or when these times fully mature, okay, I, I, the, the times have matured, but when these times are fully unveiled, guess what's going to happen? Their heart will not be able to shake evil and fear because the love of mammon has given it root. So when the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil, that doesn't mean that the love of money is the source of all evil. Because sometimes evil comes out of envy. Right? Evil comes out of laziness. Evil comes out of having a bad heart. Evil can come from ignorance. Evil can come from different sources. But evil is sustained when the love of money is involved. <laughs> the love of money is root. It allows for any kind of evil to then have a stronghold on the heart of a man. You see, the reason why many people are not in love with God as they should be is because they have chosen the pleasures of this world. The Bible says in the last days, men will become lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure, lovers of their money, rather than being lovers of God. And so it wasn't money that made them not make room in their heart for God. It was just their own pleasure seeking. However, when you now add the love of money into the mix of pleasure seeking, then that pleasure seeking psyche takes root such that even when they are trying to shake themselves from it, it becomes difficult. The opposite of that is true, that if you love God genuinely with all of your heart, 
then wisdom begins to precipitate or crystallize as it really works. Blessings precipitate, wisdom crystallizes. Let me just explain that very briefly because it helps for us to be able to picture the way we receive things from heaven. For something to precipitate is to have it begin in a spiritual form and then precipitate into a solid form or a substance that you can hold. So I can have air in this room and continue to increase the pressure until it precipitates and it becomes rain. I cannot hold air, but I can hold water. That is precipitation. Wisdom, on the other hand, so that's how your blessings work. The Bible says God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Spiritual means wind, un intangible. Spirit means wind. You cannot touch it. But by much faith and persistence, it begins to precipitate because what does faith do? Faith applies pressure on the wind of your blessing until it becomes a river of joy, until it becomes something that can quench your thirst and refresh your soul. Wisdom crystallizes. Crystal, the process of crystallization is the process of having a formation of a thing of mass beginning with a thing of minute substance. And so I can have a crystallized mountain that forms from just little rivulets of dust. And so little by little, this speck of dust begins to crystallize and then it forms a stalagmite or a stalactite, which are upward or downward facing mountains or, or, or rock structures. Wisdom works like that. It doesn't just happen to you, boom, one day you're just Solomon. You understand what I mean? The Bible says here a little and there a little. It crystallizes within you. It builds from the ground up. Precipitation comes from up to down. So that's why wisdom is the foundation. The Bible says by wisdom, the foundations are laid. Then you can then build on top of it. You understand what I mean? So when you're, when you're asking God for wisdom, now you have a picture of what you can work with. So wisdom begins to crystallize in you the moment you begin to have preference for the love of God. Because that is the beginning of wisdom. So, Matthew 7, 24. You cannot love two masters. And so where all of this is leading to is whatever your association is with money, examine your heart thoroughly and make sure that even though you have come to recognize that you need it and that you're talented at making it and that you're skilled at making a lot of it, let it be transactional. Let it not be a thing of love. Transact, but don't fall in love with mammon. And I'll tell you why very shortly. Let's go to Genesis chapter 10. Because the onus is on me not just to drop such a word, but to also, by the grace of God, continue to elaborate on the various hard postures that we need to take. So what I mean by being transactional with money and not falling in love with it, in today's English can simply be put as, simply as don't get emotionally attached to material things. Let nothing be too much for you to let go if the Lord is demanding that thing. Let nothing be of sentimental value to you if it is material. Remember the rich young ruler. Jesus was like, okay, what have you been up to? And what was his answer? He says, I've been serving God with money. That was what he said. And God, Jesus was like, okay, that's, this is a Babylonian. Because Bab Babylon or Babel means confusion by mixing. He's mixing God and money. Because almost everything he was telling Jesus that he's done for God, he did with money. Oh, I always give to the poor. They recognize me at the temple. I'm one of the big boys here. That's why they called him a rich young ruler. It was, if you're a rich young ruler in the political system, you are spending money. That's what it means. Okay, let's face the reality of it is we are in what we call a democracy, but the reality of it is what we call democracy started as a form of worship in the temple of Mammon. Can I prove that to you? Show me somebody who is elected into a prominent office who did not spend money. You can be as sharp as a spoon. No, that's a, that's a spoon is not very sharp. It was a Dutch friend of mine when we were in school who used to say that. And so that's an overflow of wickedness. <laughs> I repent from dead works. 
You can be as sharp as razor. You can be as passionate and as compassionate about the affairs of your community as possible. But if you do not spend money and line people's pockets and close people's mouths and open other people's mouths, you can't get elected. It is that simple. I mean, look around. Jesus says, by their fruits, we shall know them. By their fruits, you shall know them. And that is the reason why our politicians are getting increasingly old in age, advanced in age, because it's all about how much money you can spend. So the longer you're in the game, the more money you have amassed and the more money you can spend. So even if you can't stand without falling, you still get elected because you're spending money. It's all over the world now. We have so many presidents now that cannot say five things correctly. But guess what? They have paid the right mouse to speak for them and they have shut down the right mouse who spoke against them. This is not a political uh, observation or analysis. This was something that the Lord told me and I shared it with you in the year 2020. The Lord told me he took me to the book of Matthew when the high priest raised an offering from the temple to pay people to deny that Jesus was raised from the dead. The Bible says that Caiaphas, the high priest, he commanded for money to be bought, brought from the treasury of the house of God and used to pay soldiers who were supposed to be the bearers of the good news because they were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. The Bible says, and when they saw him who rolled away the stone, they saw the embodiment of the Holy Spirit, the resurrection power, and the high priest told them to deny it. Read your Bible, they did not see the wind. They did not assume that he was raised from the dead. The Bible says that when they saw him who rolled away the stone, they trembled and great fear came upon them. Because they saw the person or a manifest person of the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. And fear fell upon them. And the high priest said, shush, go your way and tell nobody what you have seen. And, Jesus, and, the, Lord, and the Holy Spirit said to me, I was going on the radio that morning. And the Holy Spirit told me to delay. People were calling me. They were texting me. Hey, we're waiting for you to get online. And the Holy Spirit said, wait for me first. And then he told me, he said, this is what you're about to see, not just in this nation, but around the world. People are about to be, the truth is about to be bought. And the ones that will come out are the ones that have been paid to tell a lie. When the Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. So you cannot sell the truth. So what was sold was the souls of men and their, and their allegiances. So why am I telling you these things, folks? I am telling you these things because we have to choose. Who gets our loyalty? We have to choose. Who are we in love with? Are we in love with mammon or are we in love with God? To be in love with God is to live with the daily consciousness of his love, of his grace, and of his pursuit of you so that you can return the same gesture for you to be found by the same grace for you to find the same grace that has found you. For you to find the Lord as he has found you. For you to hold on to him and never let go as he holds on to you and never lets go of you. He says, I will not let go of my beloved that I have found until I have brought her into my mother's house. He said, I'm not going to let go of my beloved. Songs of Solomon, we read that together the other day. You need to hold on to the Lord and not to anything else. You cannot hold on to God while you're holding on to your belongings. You cannot hold on to God while you're holding on to material possessions. You have to be willing to let them go. Jesus said to the rich young ruler, are you ready to follow me? Jesus says, go and sell all of what you have and follow me. And the Bible records that he went away sorrowful because he had a great possession. It is not the greatness of his possession, but it was how greatly the possession had him. When my wife came up here, she was like, I, I have money. Money does not have me. You see, the rich young ruler did not have a great possession. It was a great possession that had him. And when Jesus saw that people thought that it was because he had great possession, Jesus told them, he says, how, how difficult is it 
for a rich man to enter into the kingdom, it is like a camel going through the eye of the needle. The eye of the needle is one of the tiniest gates in the time of Jesus that people, merchants, bringing goods to sell in Jerusalem would have to go through. And when they load up their camels, the camels cannot go through the eye of the needle while they're carrying all of the incenses that they're bringing from Persia. They have to unload the camel, let it go in, and one by one bring in the instances as they are needed. Let me explain this to you because I have studied this thing and the Holy Spirit has also graced me by allowing for me to see the process. They offload the camel and then they start to bring the items in as they are needed. Why don't they bring it in at the same time? If they bring it in at the same time, there are street boys who are willing to take everything and run with it, so they only bring it in. The moment somebody says, I want to buy a bottle of, of, of myrrh, they go outside the gate and they bring the bottle of myrrh. Wealth is not supposed to be laden, it's supposed to be brought in as needed. And so everybody that you know, outside of this place, of course we are saints, people of God, everybody else out there, they're trying to save up for their future. They're trying to be laden and at the same time they want to go through the eye of the needle. Jesus says, no, you have to set the weight. Many of us are so sentimentally attached to our material possessions that even though God is telling you to leave that place and go to another, you look and you're like, man, I'm not ready to take a pay cut today. Jesus, call somebody else. But there are certain times that you, you have to take a pay cut to cut ties with the world so that you can receive a reward that is worthy of your election. I encourage you today and I'm going to speak to you plainly in just a little bit. You see, the kingdom of Nimrod was the beginning of the kingdom of this world. And that kingdom began with Babel that was called confusion by mixing and then it progressed onto Hirek and then it became Kane. But ultimately, the kingdom of Nimrod built a tower in a place that is called Shinar. Shinar refers to a place wherein you choose between two mountains. You choose between two. So we have come to a place right now where we have to choose between God and Mammon. And that is the reason why the system of the world today is another Sodom because Lot had to choose between Sodom and grace. He had to choose between Sodom and the Lord because that monetary system has to be in your face so that you are without excuse when you get before you your maker because he wants you to choose him over money your assignment for the times that we're in is to ask yourself what is in my hands what is the Lord asking of me what am I holding on to that I'm holding on to just because I I have come to love it more than I love the Lord what is it that is in my hand that I put my trust in instead of putting my trust in the Lord. Do I sleep better at night knowing fully well that, oh, I have this resource here, I have this backup plan there, I have this gold here, I have this investment here, or do I sleep just because I know the Lord has me and he is my portion? We need to make that distinction and we need to make it clear. And for some of us, we have to be tested to, be sure, to help us, not to help God. God is good. You know when someone is good, that means they're good. You don't need to add to them nor take away from them. They're good. You are the one that is still work in progress. And you will be tested to see whether you will hold on until that thing drags you into the pit. Or if you will let go so that you can go through the eye of the needle without stress. And then trust that the grace of God would allow for what you need to be brought in daily as it is needed. I tell you this, folks, the reality of the world that we're living in is that all of the temptations that have been set up and all of the trials and the turbulence that is about to hit the world is coming so that the believer can demonstrate that they have chosen the Lord and so that the unbeliever can be buried with their wealth. I tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, this is an economic warfare. You may not have people bringing guns to your house, but then at the end of the day, they're putting pressure on your heart to choose mammon and to choose fear of mammon instead of the fear of the Lord. Also, I'm led to tell you this. I saw a man that could be a man or a woman standing, and, and the significance of that, you may not know, but I'm going to just tell you real quick, this is not the first time that I'm seeing sexless people, people that don't seem to be men and women, and the very first time that I saw one very clearly or the clearest one that I saw, or the first super clear one that I saw was around the election of 2020. 
And when I saw that being, I knew that it was a messenger of Satan disguised as an angel of light. Right? Because they like their pronouns to be we are many, to be they and them. Remember the legion that possessed the madman of the gatherings? They didn't want to be identified based on any sex. They wanted to be a pronoun. Like when Jesus said, how many of you? Jesus said, don't worry about us, we're many. And they like to be, several instances, you see they refer to them as they and us. So the, 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 the morale of the story is this agent of Satan has disguised himself as an angel of light and taken command of, a, of, a, of an aircraft, a military aircraft, with human beings at the helm of affairs navigating this plane. And he stood, or she, stood between them and pointed at another aircraft that belonged to the same army because they have the same flag and emblem on them and told them to down that plane. And when I saw that, I was like, Lord, what is going on? He said, they're about to stage fake aggression. The ones who are really ruling the world on behalf of Satan, the elitist warlords and tyrants, are about to give us another show. Don't let your heart be drawn away by their sorcery. Because when you see it, many will panic and many will utter things that do not reflect confidence in God. Do not join them. I have told you today, whatever you hear when it comes to things like that, it is the same people, they're playing both sides. They will down one of their planes, planes and blame it on another so that they can instigate men against one another. I was led to share that with you. When it comes, you already know. So if anyone is saying, oh, it's these people, let your response be, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. In the day that he made us, he made us male and female. But we know that this is the work of the ones that are sexless. This is the work of the messengers of Satan, who are the shape shifters that are neither here nor there. You have been warned, let your heart remain steadfast. And let me tell you something about that bag. That bag is not your sustenance. That bag is not your sustenance. I see somebody going into their storehouse to check their bag. And what it contains, it looks like onions and garlic. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Because with that, you already know what it is. The children of Israel, even though the Lord brought them out of Egypt, they kept dreaming about the garlic and the onions of Egypt. Whereas the Lord has manna for them in the wilderness. So let me tell you something. Do not put your trust in the sack of onions and garlic. They are from Egypt. And in Egypt do they belong. Because everyone who keeps turning back to look for help where there is no help is getting ready to become a pillar of salt. Fear not, no matter what happens in the economy. Just laugh at the storm. It's not happening against you. It is happening for you. Let not your heart go down with the stock market. Let not your heart go down with the real estate market. Let not your heart go down with anything or go up with anything for that matter. Because there are times when it doesn't go down, it goes up, and then you have this confidence in mammon. How many, how many people remember crypto? Yeah. You, raise your hand. Alan, you remember crypto. The market did not go down. It went up. And when it went up, there were men of God who started to do things that God did not ask them to do. Just because mammon is telling them, I'm with you. You know, you look at your crypto and you're like, man, I have all that money now. And then you, you go shopping. You go causing trouble. Because you think God is with you. No, it was mammon that is with you. And the Bible says wealth will develop wings and fly away. What I am saying to you is be reinforced in your heart against material possession. I'm not saying don't allow your creativity to bring you plenty. No, 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 no. Do that which the Lord has done for you, has given you to give to the world. Use your time, use your creativity, make that money, but be transactional with mammon. Do not put your trust in mammon. Don't allow your heart to fall in love with mammon. One last thing that we're going to do, actually, let's go ahead and break bread. We'll do it together. As I was speaking to you, the Lord showed me a nurse in a hospital and could also be a clinic. It's just the, the size, the, the corner of it that I saw didn't show, okay, now it's, it's a hospital. As I was saying, it, the angel of the Lord panned the, build, the image around, and it was actually a hospital. And it's a very big hospital. So it's, an, it's a hospital that belongs to the system. 
And this nurse was there measuring a medication in a syringe and ready to go. And the man that was about to be injected already rolled up his sleeves, but then he was asked to read a scroll and agree before they gave him the injection. And then I inquired further of the Lord, and the Lord said to me, those who do not know that I am resurrection and life will go seeking for life where there is no life. I want to encourage you, do not go seeking for help or health or healing where there is none. The Lord says, I am your healer. The Lord says that I am the glory and the lifter of your head. And I want to just encourage you because there is something about sitting in that chair. What I saw, it was as if the man could no longer help himself like he's already been chained to where he was. So this is one of those things. I want you to just let it sink within you. When the time comes, this revelation, this wisdom will guide you. When the time comes, this wisdom will guide you so that you are not endorsing or thumbprinting or signing your soul away. Again, like I told you, if you took the prophecy about the places that will be locked up and you took it according to the order of the prophecy of the beast that was brought from the land divided by rivers, then you will know what I have just said to you is I'm reading to you now from right to left. So what I've just told you about the nurse and the injection and the document that is to be signed has to do with things that happened before the image was brought from Mexico. That image was brought late 2021. So this hospital scene that I just painted for you would have to happen before then because I am telling you after. So this is the inverse. So when we're coming from left to right, we saw this, we, saw, we, we had the word of the Lord and the revelation that we needed to arm, we needed to equip ourselves with, uh, ourselves with a scripture. This was January 2020 that would secure our hearts so that we don't give in to fear, but fear was coming. And after fear came, help was pro, 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 produced or provided or prescribed. And then afterwards, we saw the image and then we saw the war. And now I am telling you that what, I'm, what I just described to you on Saturday is in the order of November, December of 2021. And so the syringe will be what happened before then. Let him who has an understanding or let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches so that you don't find yourself in that seat. The moment you find yourself in that seat, you have to agree to their terms. And they don't want your money, they want your soul. Don't leave Goshen. Let us break bread. Genesis chapter 5 verse 5. What I quoted to you earlier was Genesis chapter 10 verse 10. The beginning of the kingdom of Nimrod from Babylon to Shinar was 10.10, 10, which is the test. 10 is the number of tests, okay? So I told you what the test is. We've been tested with the system. But now Genesis chapter 5 verse 5, we're going to look into the grace that is being made available. Genesis chapter 5 verse 5. Okie dokie. And, and I'm glad that I'm speaking to a cross-section of Americans because primarily, and then all that can watch from different places, we, we have seen numbers in operation in this country, right? Because we know when I tell you that 11 is the number of destruction, you don't have to, you have seen it. The, 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 uh, the, the flight that crashed into the World Trade Center on 9-11 was what flight? Flight, it was called the American 11. It was flight number 11. It was also the number of destruction. These things, some people who are being used by Satan or some people who are involved don't even know what they're doing. But these things are happening because you have an understanding and you can deduce these things when you see them. Because the Bible says that you are inexcusable. God has already gone ahead of you in his predestination to flood your heart with so much knowledge. Not, not in such a way that it washes you away, but it comes incrementally until it becomes abundant around you. 
And, and the way that he does it is this. God makes sure that he doesn't do a thing without revealing it first to his servants, the prophets. And he uses his numerology and he uses his heart and his love to communicate these things. May your heart receive deep unto deep. So Genesis chapter 5 verse 5. It says, so all the days of Adam. All the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. 930 years and he died. We're going to break bread with our scripture today because on Saturday we broke bread with um, Genesis eleven seventeen. Do you remember? That after Peleg was born, which was in the year that the land was divided, Eber lived another 430 years. 430 years refers to the time of promise, the duration of promise made and promise fulfilled. 430 years after God promised Abraham that his descendants will be blessed was when Moses came to announce salvation. All right? 430 years. Now, we're bre we broke bread with that because we wanted our hearts to be confident that even though there is a separation of the wheat from the tares, the lands are being divided. We're in the age of Peleg once again, but we are Eber. Eber refers to your spirit man because Eber means the one that comes from beyond the water. And the water above is called heavens and your spirit is from heaven. So your spirit will emerge into the blessing of God after this season is over. Do you understand what I'm saying? That was how we broke bread on Saturday. But we're breaking bread with the life of Adam today because Adam, in addition to that 430 years, he lived 500 years and five is the number of grace. And the Lord is saying that I have shown you the blessing. Now I want you to receive the grace for the blessing because the blessing together with the grace of God is the fullness of the life that God has for you as the last Adam on earth. We are the last ones because we are the beloved that will remain. Joseph Biden, it's in that name. That name is a prophetic name to the body of Christ, to the ecclesia. The word Joseph talks about the, the beloved, even though it literally, it literally means the Lord will add. Remember the scripture that this woman of God read to us later on. She was talking about that when the praises of the Lord shall fill the earth, that the Lord will bring an increase. The Lord will add. It means the Lord will yourself. It will add to us. And so for the Lord to add to us, we are the ones that he is adding to his family. Okay, that is the reason why we are called Joseph. But we are the generation upon whom the end of the ages have come. We will abide. The word biding is old English for remaining, to remain. So the ones that he wants to add to his family that will remain. We are the last Adam and our blessing has to have a correlation to the blessings of the first Adam. And that is 500 for grace, 430 for blessing. That blessing does not have anywhere to stand except for on top of the grace of God. I know these things may sound mathematical, may be a little convoluted, but you need to just meditate upon it because of the fact that the time is short. And when the time is short, we can no longer speak as plainly because plain words are watered down. We need to receive mysteries and just swallow them. You understand what I mean? Because the man of God was given a book because the time was short and he was told to just eat the book. And when he ate the book, he was bitter. He was like, oh my God, this is, this is hard. But the Bible says he made his belly sweet. So that which I am saying to you as you're consuming it, it might sound bitter. But just believe in the Lord and believe also in me. And it shall be well with you because when this thing gets inside of you, it will begin to recalibrate your dependence, your ability to depend on things so that you can depend fully on God and not on mammon. The Lord has done you a favor by bringing you such a word of acceleration. Don't let it bother you the way that it is coming forth. You just make time. Listen to it again and again. 930 is the secret number for today. 430 was for for. For, for Saturday. And hopefully maybe one of these days I can even break it down to you because there is a relationship between those numbers. The uh, Praise God. God is good. So, we will do something today. We will break bread. And we will say, Lord, our blessings are guaranteed by your grace. My 430 is guaranteed by the 500. Because the promise has been made and I will be delivered because my king's man, Redeemer, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one, is coming for me. Is coming with his saints for the remnants, for us, the ones that remain, the Josephs that abide. He is coming for us in the mighty name of Jesus. So, Father, we thank you because all of that is going to be by your grace. So, I want you to say, Father, thank you for your grace. And as we break bread today, you can say other prayers as you are led, but I want you to ensure that you say this thing, I submit to grace. We thank you, Jesus, for your body and your blood. You may eat and drink. The body and the blood of the Lamb of God. Praise the Lord. I haven't preached a message like this in a while because my wife would tell me, see all that math that you were doing is for you. Break things down. So, you know, I still would want to honor my wife. So hopefully maybe on Saturday, maybe we're going to break this thing down some more. But up until then, I pray that you will find time to go and listen to it again and let the Lord minister to you the life that is in it. Let me tell you, the Lord reminded me of what I just did today, even before the service started. The Holy Spirit said to me, he said I needed to go in the car that he wanted to talk to me. So I sat in the car and it took me to Revelations chapter 21 and 22. And it said to me, what did the angel said to Daniel. I mean, yeah. It's because I think that, that, that Daniel was the angel. But what did the angel say unto John? He said to John, we have come to a point because of the shortness of the time. He says, let he that is unjust remain unjust. Let he that is unholy remain unholy. He said, but let the just remain just and the holy remain holy. What he is saying is, there is no time for us to now begin again with the elementary or the fundamental basics. We have gone past that point. The people that are already on this journey, let them stay on this journey because of the shortness of the time. So because of the shortness of the time, I am speaking to you as the angel of the Lord spoke to John using numbers because they tell a lot. But I'm going to leave you with this thing today. Come with me to Numbers chapter 7 verse 12. We're just going to read that one. And if Alan is ready to go home, he can just come and grab the mic. Numbers chapter 7 verse 12. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So that's number four, right? Numbers chapter 7. Numbers chapter 7 is a really long chapter. It's got 89 verses. See if you can memorize that. Numbers chapter 7 verse 12. And it says, And the one who offered his offering on the first day was Nashon, the son of Abinadab from the tribe of Judah. The one that offered what? His offering on the first day was of the family of Judah. Okay? So there is something about, some people will come later on and repent. But you should offer praise on the first day. The reason why all of these things are coming forth is because when the news breaks, even Sheila was sharing with me what the Lord had revealed to her. Many we will, there will be a lamentation in Ramah. There will be a lamentation in Ramah because what John saw was so devastating that fire came from heaven and consumed Satan and his army to the point where there was no ocean left upon the earth. It was said that there was no ocean. And Jesus came and he saw the devastation and he says, It's okay, I'm going to renew everything. He says, behold, I make all things new. Why is he going to make all things new? Because of the extent of devastation. He would have to renew everything. And so that is the reason why there will be lamentation in Ramah. He came and himself was consoling the remnants that remain. When you look at Revelations 21, 22, that was Jesus coming to console the ones that remain, saying now, just breathe. The wicked have been consumed from the earth. They have been licked by the fire of God, even together with their sword. But you now... Be confident that I will make all things new. 
for that level of devastation to happen, there will be weeping in Ramah. It is the will of God for it to happen. Because when Jesus came the first time, there was lamentation in Ramah. All the little children that were the joy of the world, they were slain because the joy had come. I want to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, when these things come, you from the first day should have a sacrifice of praise. Don't complain first and then say, oh, okay, well, they say we should thank God. Pastor Moses said we should thank God. And we try that. No, no, no. I, I want you to have a reward. See, these guys were rewarded because there was an angel of the Lord who was keeping watch over what happens on the first day. And on the first day, they came and they made a sacrifice of praise. The first day of this thing, when it happens, the Lord is watching out for you. You need to give a sacrifice of praise. Communion house, God bless you. Don't let your hand be short to the work of God. We've been reminded lately that we need to step out in faith and in gratitude to God to make ourselves genuinely a part of what God is doing in this house. You see what I mean? The early church, they brought to the apostles' feet all that they had, that it might be distributed to each and everyone according to their needs. We may not be there yet, but we will get there. But for now, let us ensure that there is nothing that is paid for here that is paid for without you being a part of it. So I want you to recognize that there is a need and for you to respond. Thank God for the people who responded already from Saturday. But I want to encourage you, let's not make our hands short toward the one whose hand is never short toward us, the God of our salvation. God bless you. I'll see you on Saturday by the grace of God. Alan. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Come on. As we give our offering tonight, let us stand. Let's stand in praise. Let's stand in thanksgiving for what the Lord has done. To our family online, those here, you'll see the giving details on the screen. Dollar sign, Communion House, Cash App, at Communion House, PayPal, as well as the Zelle information there. If you need an envelope, you can see my brother Kenyatta there. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship, of meeting with us, oh God. Another opportunity to offer praise unto you, to honor you in our giving, to be reminded of this ministry, oh God, this household that you have called us to, where we have been blessed, where we have been poured into, O oh God, unto the full, even unto overflow, Lord. Now as we come before you, as you indeed are in our midst, let these offerings be pleasing unto you, O oh God. We receive a cheerful mind, a cheerful heart in giving tonight, Lord, knowing that you are coming and that your reward is with you, that you're coming quickly even, O oh God. Father, as we stand before you, we give you praise. We declare unto you that you are our provider, that you give seed to us, that we may show that it may be found pleasing unto you. Father, we thank you for every talent that you have granted unto us and to this house, Lord, and the wisdom to do business until you return. Lord, all glory and honor belong to you. And we all say it. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. God is good. Let's go ahead and give him praise for what he's done, for the testimonies that have come forth, for the revelation that we have received. God is so good. Don't forget, we'll be praying tomorrow night, 9 p.m. on Instagram. Let's continue to press into that and go from there. Everyone have a blessed night.